and we continue to bleed in the equity markets. Welcome. This is Macro Money. I'm Elias Pivak, head of Global Macro here at Tasty Live. No respite today for Wall Street as the bleeding continues for yet another day. But nothing really uh, on the immediate uh, docket as far as economic news to throw a wrench in the works unless sentiment itself is going to change. And so uh, a different focus for us here uh, today and a trip outside of U.S. markets because there is something that's occurring elsewhere here that is grabbing attention and has scope for volatility and as ever. That takes us to currencies. And what we're going to focus on today is the Japanese yen, which, against the backdrop of shifting Fed policy odds, has found itself at the lowest levels in 34 years. Needless to say, uh, given the penchant for Japanese authorities to intervene when prices go uh, to extremes the question has understandably emerged how far is too far has the yen finally fallen to a place where authorities will do more than talk about being displeased with these levels and we'll talk in just a second about why they're displeased and is this now the time where in some kind of an intervention, some kind of a violent yen rally, thanks to officials wading into markets, is that finally afoot? And so what we're going to do here is we're going to first start with how the yen got here, how Japanese officials are looking at it, and the lens through which um, they approach the situation, and why the trigger for them to act may well be here within the next day. As uh, critical economic data essentially spurs the situation. So let's begin here with a look at the end. This is uh, 6J futures, and we can see here that really since the beginning of the year, the yen has been falling like a rock. But that's not too discount the preceding sharp rally that occurs from late October, early November. And the logic behind that rally and the reason that we're here now all fit into a clean continuum. The Federal Reserve begins to signal actively in late October and makes official at the uh, FOMC announcement um, on November the 1st that they believe they are done raising interest rates, that the next step is for them to cut. Now, needless to say, this leaves the markets to speculate how many times they're going to cut, how much easing is on the menu, and rabid speculation ensues. This is followed shortly and very typically by an extension of whatever is going on with the reimagining of the outlook in U.S. rates as markets start to bake out cuts to rates everywhere because the U.S. dollar is such a ubiquitous unit of global commercial exchange that when you alter the course of borrowing costs, of dollars, what you're doing is you're altering the course of borrowing in the currency that is the lifeblood, not just of the U.S. economy, but the global economy. So you're altering the course of borrowing everywhere, save for perhaps very insignificant exceptions like North Korea. And what you very quickly start to see is not only do rate cut expectations build out for the Fed, they build out everywhere. They build out for all the major central banks that joined the Fed in its aggressive rate hike cycle to tame inflation, call it uh, the kind of G10, G7 
usual suspects, the ECB, the Bank of England, the Reserve Bank of Australia, the Reserve Bank of New Zealand, the Bank of Canada, on and on. The difference is Japan. The standout is Japan, which has had, at this point, negative interest rates and very dovish monetary policy, never went on a meaningful uh, hiking cycle uh, as the others did in 2021, 2022, has had that very dovish monetary policy forever and ever for their own domestic local reasons. And so you end up in the beginning of November in a situation where everybody's cutting except Japan. And so there is scope for the yen with its low rates to see other central banks cutting and shrinking their yield advantage against the yen. So not surprisingly, the yen soars. And that's the narrative that you come into 2024 with. The yen is sharply higher as you start to get rate cuts built out in the U.S. and by extension elsewhere because you are in a situation where everybody's cutting except Japan. So everybody's rates are going to become less attractive relative to what's going on in Japan. Though in Japan, they're very low. Everybody else is going to be less higher. And then the plot changes. And it changes in a hurry. Now, you can see here, this is the longer term relationship between the yen and global yields and the inverse relationship here could not be more unmistakable. So when you put this in context, here is that reversal in the yen, and here is what happens with global yields. Again, this is an average of yields in the U.S., the Eurozone, the U.K., and Australia. All central banks that, after a major hiking cycle here, we're all expected to start cutting, hence the pullback and the rise in the yen. And here is the turn of the calendar year. What happens there? Well, U.S. economic data starts to outperform relative to expectations. And the markets start to ask themselves, okay, how many rate cuts is this Fed actually likely to do? Well, when you look at a chart that We've been watching for quite a while here. You can see that at the start of the year, this is that yen rally from late October, early November into the start of the year. The market goes out to price as many as six cuts, 150 basis points in cuts at 25 basis points apiece. And then as the data starts to get better here and the market goes, ah, I don't know about all that. That seems like a lot of cuts for an economy that's accelerating. You start to see the cuts diminish. And while it takes a while for stocks to really get the memo, because as we've argued here uh, countless times, for stocks, it's the promise of future money that is a risk on catalyst. And you don't get stocks capitulating until this point here where there are actually fewer cuts than the Fed itself expects. And that's ultimately what marks a turning point in stock markets. Exactly, by the way, as we've argued here for months and months and months. The situation in currencies is much more straightforward. Here's the dollar. When you get more cuts, the dollar comes down. When you get fewer cuts, the dollar comes back up. And of course, for the yen, it is much the same. As you get more rate cuts, the yen rallies. As those rate cuts start to go away, here's the turning point at the calendar year move from last year into 2024, the yen tops, and off we go. Now, Japanese authorities don't love this. And there is some element of this that is, in fact, helpful. 
Japan is still very much an export-oriented economy. So a cheaper currency does, to some extent, help because it makes Japanese exports cheaper, relatively speaking, in other uh, currency terms on global markets and helps to boost that demand. But that's not really the biggest deal for Japanese companies today as it has been in the past because much of Japanese manufacturing at this point isn't done in Japan. The aging of Japan's population has been a story that's been at work in Japan for longer than uh, much of the rest of the of the developed world, where now that's a much bigger uh, concern. We, of course, uh, know that China has now said that um, their population is shrinking. This is very much uh, an issue in Western Europe. This is very much an issue in uh, Korea, in all, all kinds of places. But Japan, now the oldest country in the in in the world by uh, median age, it's been wrestling with this for decades. And the solution they came up with was: we need to be building our stuff where the markets are. So the biggest buyer, let's say, of um, of Japanese cars, tends to be North America. The plants are in North America. And so export in this sense isn't really the biggest motivating factor. Rather, it's cost of living. And what the weak yen does for an island economy that imports 60%, give or take, of its food, that imports an overwhelming percentage of its energy that imports a whole lot of everything that it consumes that's a big big headwind so japanese authorities don't love that the yen is weakening to this extent and they've made no secret of it there has been a steady stream of comments from officials saying we think these moves are speculative we think that the market should reflect fundamentals. These moves seem outsized. They seem uh, like they don't make sense from our perspective. And all of this is kind of signaling to say we have not been afraid to step into markets before. So you shouldn't think that we're going to be afraid to step into markets here. We don't like this. And we might act. Now that has not really spooked speculators as yet. And that's a key consideration for Japanese authorities. Because they don't generally like to fight markets. They've learned that lesson over the the years. There's been a lot of instances of uh, intervention uh, in the past where Japanese authorities weighed in. There's a big splash move in the yen, either up or down, depending on where they want to push it. And it very quickly recedes because the trend in markets is what it is, and ultimately not even central banks can stop the moving of what is the most liquid market in the world, the currency market. And so what you have here then is a change in strategy that occurs right around 2010, perhaps, uh, somewhere just after the global financial crisis where the Bank of Japan realizes they don't need to be in a hurry. They can let the market exhaust itself and begin to turn in a direction that they find is where they want to push investors. And once the market itself starts to turn to really pile in and help the markets get into that direction with the least bit of resistance, and the most fireworks. Well, if they don't like this yen weakness, then the trigger for something like this might well come by way of Japanese CPI data due to come across the wires this week. Now, we can see just how important the influence of the yen on inflation here is because we can see the outsized component here continues to be food. And as we 
uh, just mentioned, over 60% of the food Japan consumes is imported. So when the yen collapses, that's obviously a very major issue for baseline cost of living. All that imported food becomes more expensive in yen terms. And we can see that's very much the critical aspect of inflation. We can see that when energy prices were spiking with Russia's invasion of Ukraine in early 2022, that was a big consideration. That, of course, has uh, had a long period of factoring out for all major economies as uh, the spike abated and prices fell. And we've had to see uh, the disinflationary influence, deflationary influence from energy uh, readjust this calculus. This has happened in the U.S., in Europe, and of course, uh, also in Japan. But as we can see, that's faded as of the latest numbers because the adjustment has all but run its course and energy has bounced a bit in recent months. So this is now a clear and present concern. Japan might see inflation get off the rails if the yen is falling in an uncontrolled fashion, and what then happens is both energy and food start to get progressively more expensive in yen terms. Now, there is, of course, a tailwind. As we've been looking at here, we have a situation, at least on the food front, that seems to be working in favor of those economies where inflation was significantly amplified by food. This is uh, the Eurozone, this is um, the UK, and of course, Japan. And we, and we can see in the green line there, that's the UN's food price index. And then there's CPI numbers here for the Eurozone, the UK, and Japan, and they're lagged seven months. So we can see here that it takes about seven months for moves in that food index to show up in those countries' CPI numbers, and that there is a tail here left suggests there's still quite a bit more of weaker global food costs to make its way into CPI and to push it lower. But note here, while this continues to be helpful in the Eurozone and in the UK, in Japan, it's diverged recently. And that's arguably that massive yen sell-off. That's arguably how you get this kind of a thing starting to work in the wrong direction. The losses in the pound and the losses in the euro have not been nearly so dramatic as to jettison this dynamic. But in Japan, it's becoming a little bit of a concern. Now, we can see here that the inflation numbers are expected to come in unchanged in March from February, 2.8% uh, year on year. So not immediately action-packed on the surface. But if we look at the way that Japanese economic data has performed relative to expectations, then we can see it's popped above the zero line for this Citigroup Economic Surprise Index and has held there since the beginning of the year. So what we find is that Japanese economic data has tended to outperform relative to forecasts. It basically just says that economists' models are understating the vigor of Japan's economy. That probably also means that they're understating the degree to which that economy is producing inflationary pressure. That might well set the stage for the Bank of uh, Japan to be faced with a higher reading here than 2.8%. This might surprise on the upside. And if it does, the key question will be why. If it's surprising to the upside for these kinds of global reasons, like, say, food, well, that might not be the world's biggest concern because we do have a tale of f further food price declines, as we just saw here. And we've, of course, also seen that appear uh, in lower than expected readings in uh, some pockets, but then not others. So there's 
some level of uh, of noise here month to month. For example, UK uh, CPI just overnight came down, but less than expected. Eurozone CPI came down more than expected. And food has been a critical uh, amplifier, as we can see, on both of those economies' uh, inflation readings. So if we look at what might happen here with Japan, if it's food, then it could go one way or another for Japanese policymakers. They wouldn't necessarily be catalyzed into action. But if the number is higher, one thing that might occur is a speculative interest in markets to say, oh, well, this might mean the Bank of Japan needs to hike again. So far, they've hiked just the one time this year to bring rates out of negative territory, and expectations are relatively stayed for how much more they're willing to do. But if, in fact, we get a hotter number, the markets might well say this is something that could get them to hike again and sooner than previously expected. And what that might mean is the yen starts to come up off these lows which would be precisely the environment in which the Bank of Japan would be looking and saying, ah, perhaps momentum has shifted. We don't need to fight the markets now in intervening, so let's intervene. And the response might well be a violent yen rally in the making. Now, that's not to say it has to happen immediately. But if this CPI data does surprise on the upside, then being on the lookout for a sharp yen rise certainly seems like a reasonable thing to do. And that is macro money for today. Thanks very much for joining. As ever, we are here Monday through Thursday, right after Overtime, a show that I co-host with Dylan Radigan and Chris Vecchio, looking at the Wall Street close and what it might mean going forward. Back on with Chris for Futures Power Hour on Fridays. I'm on with Victor Jones for The Price of Truth on Wednesdays. That's tonight, just a half hour after we wrap up here, so definitely join for that. I'm back on with Victor for uh, First Call with uh, Tom on Sundays, writing for the news and insights portion of tastylive.com and opining on the platform formerly known as Twitter at Ilya Spivak. Happy trading. See you tomorrow.